Hello and welcome to Unit 1. In this unit we'll be looking at the atomic structure of the atom. It's important to understand the atomic structure of the atom because it really lets us understand how electricity flows and how it's going to react and how it's going to act in different situations. It's fundamental to our understanding of current, voltage, capacitance, inductance, all the different aspects of electricity, magnetism, and electromagnetism. So with that, let's get started. At the end of this module, we should be able to label or list the major parts of an atom. We'll also discuss the law of charges. And along the way, we'll talk about the influence of centrifugal force on the rotation of electrons around the nucleus. Finally, we'll talk about conductors, semiconductors, and insulators. The Greeks were the first ones to write down information about electricity. So they're credited with discovering electricity. But before that, it was always known that if you take a piece of amber, which is fossilized tree sap, it's a semi-precious stone. If you were to take a piece of amber and a piece of cloth, and again, they would use a piece of cloth, they wore a lot of woolen materials, a lot of fur. If you took that amber and then rubbed it up against the piece of cloth, you would then put a static charge on the piece of amber, as well as the piece of cloth. And once you had rubbed that amber on the piece of cloth, and it gained this charge, you could then do things with it. It's much like rubbing a rubber balloon on your head, and then the balloon will stick to the wall or make your hair stand up. They would use the piece of amber to then pick up either small pieces of fabric or pieces of straw. And they found it quite entertaining. And because the Greek word for amber is electron, that's where we get our word or term for the electron is from when people used to take a piece of amber, rub it onto another material, and then charge it. Here we see somebody rubbing a balloon on a piece of fur. The fur still happens to be attached to a dog. And once you have a static charge on the balloon, then you can do things with that static charge. You can either have the balloon attracted to something or in this case, the little thin piece of tissue paper loop is repelled by the balloon and it appears that the tissue is floating or levitating above the balloon. Statics can be a lot of fun and they were quite entertaining for centuries. In the early 1700s, about 300 years ago, a young French chemist by the name of Charles Francois de Cittenay du Fay discovered the existence of two types of electricity. We now know them as positive and negative charges. He also noted the difference between two types of materials. He called them electrics and non-electrics. We now know them as conductors and insulators. What he did was he took different types of materials, rubbed them together and categorized them and kept a detailed archive of the different types of materials. Once Charles Dufay had categorized the materials, he noticed that anything that was on list A, which at that time he considered electrics, always repelled other items from list A other electrics. And after rubbing materials together, he noticed that materials from list B always repelled similar materials from list B. However, any material from list A, after it was rubbed on something, would be attracted to something on list B. And from that, he came up with the law of charges. 
Dufay had noticed, once he had categorized, that similar items always repelled each other. Anything from list A repelled anything from list A. And anything from list B, when suspended to another item similar in list B, also repelled itself. So like materials repelled each other. However, if you took a material from list A and suspended that body next to a material from list B, then those two materials would be attracted to each other. And that's our law of charges. Unlike charges attract and like charges repel. Charles Dufay had made such an important discovery and his simple statement of like charges repel and opposites attract was so critical to our understanding of what and how things happen in electricity. It would take many centuries before we would actually understand what was going on at the subatomic level and what the charges were and how they were being transferred from one material to the other. And so far we looked at a couple of things. One was the law of charges, where likes repel but opposites attract. And that came from Dufay, who worked with a lot of statics, where he realized that if you rub two dissimilar metals or materials, not necessarily metals, materials together, that a charge was placed on both of these materials, one being slightly more positive and one being more negative. To understand how these charges are developed, we have to look further into what is creating those charges. So we have to look at the atom. The atom is the basic building block of the universe. Everything that we interact with, all the physical stuff that we can interact with, is made up of what we call matter. Matter is anything that has mass and takes up space. Matter is made up of atoms in its purest form, or simplest form, I should say. Atoms can be chemically separated into what we call elements. So different elements are made up of single atoms. An element is a substance that cannot be divided into a simpler substance chemically. An element is made up of, or can be made up of, multiple atoms of the same type. When you bring different atoms together that are of different types, well then we form what we call molecules and compounds, which are different chemical elements together to form a new substance. The principal parts of an atom are the electron, neutron, and proton. In the little graphic here, the yellow things zipping around the center spot represents the electrons. In the center, we call that the nucleus, and it's made up of orange and green circles here. They represent the neutrons and the protons. Neutrons and protons are found in the nucleus. Electrons orbit or circle around the nucleus. We're not gonna get into too much chemistry. We just wanna look at the parts and the charges associated with them. But again, an element is composed of only one type of atom. The periodic table lists all the known elements to man, or at least the ones that we know of right now. The atomic number that is associated with the periodic table shows the number of protons in the nucleus. Now, typically there should be in a balanced atom, the same number of protons as there are neutrons and the same number of electrons. It's not always the case. Sometimes they're slightly different one from another, but that's not part of this discussion. 
And as mentioned before, a molecule is a result of having more than one type of atom come together to form a new material that is chemically different from the previous. To further explain what a molecule is and how it relates differently to an atom or an element, let's take a look at a water molecule. A water molecule is made up when an oxygen atom combines with two hydrogen atoms, H2O. So there's two hydrogen atoms combined with an oxygen. Why look at a simple water molecule, you ask? Well, that's because it's very easy to relate to three of the states of matter. Matter being stuff, or everything, the physical stuff that the universe is made up of. And pretty much everybody can relate to water. Water, when it's really cold, turns into a solid. And as you add heat to the water, it will then turn into a liquid. If you continue to add more heat energy to the system, the water will then start to boil and it'll turn into a gas. So water very easily can change from a solid to a liquid to a gas simply by adding heat energy. It's something that all of us can relate to. In the last slide, we looked at water and how water can exist in three states. Something that we can all relate to. Ice, liquid water, and steam. Most matter, especially in their elemental form, can actually exist in four states. A solid, a liquid, a gas, and plasma. A solid has very, very strong bonds, and it can be totally self-contained. It doesn't require any containment whatsoever. With a liquid, as you add heat energy, the molecules tend to move around a little bit more. It makes them a little bit more liquid, like water. They have slightly weaker bonds that can be broken apart, but it also requires more containment than a solid. It requires some containment, or container, like a glass or a jar. As we add more heat energy to that system, the molecules start moving more and more and more. They're bouncing around and bouncing off of each other, and there's very little if no bonds whatsoever. So that means when matter or something gets to the gaseous state, it requires more containment than a liquid. It requires containment on all sides. If we were to continue to add more energy to the system, we would actually what they call ionize the material, which means we would actually be adding electrons to it or removing electrons from it. At that particular time, there's excess or extra energy and the molecules are all over the place and it requires even more containment, special containment, usually in the form of electromagnetic or electrical fields. A few examples of some solids that you might be able to relate to come in different forms. They can either be in pure elements, which contain only one atom, such as copper, it may be a simple molecule or compound such as water, where there's two hydrogens for every one oxygen. It may be a specialized, very unique crystalline structure of one element, such as diamond, which is made out of carbon. Or it may be an extremely complex compound, which could be made up of many different types of molecules, such as a pair of wire strippers, as seen in the lower right-hand side. These are all examples of different types of solids. As we add heat energy to the ice, 
the water turns into a liquid. Because the molecules have more energy, they move around more freely. Some other examples of liquids, well, might be bimpiju or beer. Some more examples might be mercury, a metal that is actually in its liquid form at room temperature. Those three, mercury, beer, and water, are what we call Newtonian fluids. When force is exerted upon them, they easily move out of the way. The last one, ketchup, something we might put on french fries or cheeseburger at McDonald's, is what we call a non-Newtonian fluid. It's special in the case that if you exert a force on a non-Newtonian fluid, it actually reacts like a solid and it will actually exert force back and will not move out of the way. If we continue to add heat energy to our water, the water will start to boil and it'll turn the liquid water into steam. And the steam is vaporized water or a gas. Other gases can take many different forms, and there's so many of them around us, such as methane, which is the cow. Maybe you've eaten something that didn't agree with you, and maybe you've generated some methane. Some gases are very bad for us, such as chlorine gas. But a lot of them in the right mixture are exactly what we need to live, such as in our atmosphere. Our atmosphere is made up of many different types of gases, such as mostly nitrogen, oxygen, argon, water vapor, and carbon dioxide. Too much of any one is not good for us, but in the proper concentrations, it's exactly what we need to live. Plasma. It's the most beautiful, it's the most powerful, and it can be the most destructive state of matter there is. It contains so much energy that can actually destroy things. As you continue to add energy from a solid and add energy and turn it into a liquid and add energy to the liquid to turn it into a gas, you continue to add enough energy depending on the material, you can get it to plasma but you may destroy it in the process. Plasma requires special containment. So to recap, there are four states of matter. And to go from one state to the next, you need to add energy. To go from a solid to a liquid, you need to add energy. The molecules move around more and more because they contain more energy. If you continue to add more energy, your liquid will turn into a gas. Again, the molecules move more and more and vibrate more and move around more, so you need more containment. And if you continue to add yet even more energy, the material will go into a plasma state where it's actually ionized. And at that point, it will most likely destroy any compounds or molecules and return the matter back to its elemental states. Now let's take a minute and actually take a look at the atom itself. Again, the atom is the fundamental building blocks of all matter. The idea is that atoms are made up of three main parts. One is the electron and it orbits outside the nucleus. The nucleus is the central part or the center part of the atom. And inside the nucleus, it's made up of two different types of particles, neutrons and protons. So again, there's three particles, electrons, protons, and neutrons. The nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. The electrons have a negative charge associated with them. The protons have a positive charge. 
pro positive. The neutrons don't have any charge whatsoever. It appears that the neutrons provide mass to the element. Again, neutrons are neutral or have no charge whatsoever. Previously, we had just mentioned that the electrons have a negative charge and the protons have a positive charge. And if we think back to Charles Dufay and the law of charges, we know that opposites attract. And since protons and electrons are opposite charges, it would seem to make sense that they are attracted to each other. The law of charges say that light charges repel, but opposite charges are attracted to each other. And that is indeed the case between the negative charge of the electron and the positive charge of the proton. And in a, what we call a balanced atom, the negative charges of the electron even out or equal the positive charges of the protons. So there is always an equal number of electrons for the number of protons in the nucleus. But when I first introduced the three parts of the atom, the protons, neutrons, and electrons, I said that the protons and the neutrons were in the middle, in the nucleus, and the electrons were outside the nucleus. How is that possible? Why wouldn't the electrons just go into the nucleus as well to be with the protons to cancel those charges out? Well, the answer is kind of simple. The electrons aren't static or stationary. The Niels Bohr model of the atom proposed that the electrons are orbiting or spinning around outside the nucleus of the atom. We believe that the electrons are spinning at a very, very high velocity, near the speed of light. So even though maybe this electron is being attracted to the proton inside, there's an equal force, rotational force, pulling the electron away from the nucleus. The velocity of the electron keeps it from falling into the nucleus. An external force pushing out on an object to keep it from falling in is what we call a centrifugal force. And that centrifugal force is constantly pulling the electron out from its rotational velocity or with its rotational velocity, which keeps in balance with the force of attraction due to the law of charges of the negative charge of the electron wanting to fall in and combine with the positive charge of the proton in the nucleus. The electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. It says a circular fashion, but it's more of a spherical sort of fashion so that they form shells around the nucleus. You can sort of, in a little bit of a way, think about electrons orbiting around the nucleus like planet Earth orbits around the sun, but with a slight difference. In the top half of this animation, you can see the red nucleus with rings of electrons orbiting around it. And that's sort of how we would envision planet Earth going around the sun. But remember I said there was a little bit of a difference. One of the differences is the speed of which the electrons are orbiting around the nucleus. It's close to the speed of light. The other major difference is, is it's just not in a nice ring-like fashion. 
It's more of a spherical fashion. They're constantly spinning around and around, and since all electrons are the same charge, negatively charged, they all sort of try and keep their distance away from each other. So they're always equidistant or equal distances from each other. And as one slightly wobbles in its orbit, that forces all the others to slightly wobble in their orbits. And since they're going so, so fast, there's a cross-sectional view in the bottom part of this animation. And you can see it looks like there's bowls sitting inside of bowls inside of bowls. So that the electrons orbiting actually form shells or spheres, if you wish, around the nucleus. And that's why we call electron orbits shells. Since electrons have a negative charge and protons have a positive charge, what we call a balanced atom always has the same number of electrons as it does protons in the nucleus. That way, the overall net charge of the atom is zero. If we should add an extra electron, the atom becomes ionized. It has a net extra negative charge. So an extra electron negatively ionizes an atom. If we should somehow remove an electron, then there'd be more protons than electrons. So overall, the atom would then have a net positive charge. And we call that positively charged atom a positive ion. And electrons can either be added or removed only in the outermost shell. The outermost shell really determines the chemical properties of an element, as well as its electrical properties. This outermost shell is what we call the valence shell. And really what it is, it's about the number of electrons that are available to do something, either electrically or chemically. So the valence shell is the outermost shell of the atom. This is the periodic table. You're probably familiar with it. It shows all the elements or atoms currently known to man. Previously, I had just stated that the electrical properties of an element or material determines, is determined by the number of electrons in the valence shell, or how many electrons are available to do something in the outermost shell. But how does that work? How can I determine the number of electrons in the outermost shell, or how many electrons are available to do something for me? Well, let's take a look at two examples to explain this. First, let's take a look at carbon. Carbon's number is six. And we'll also take a look at copper. And its atomic number is 29. So carbon, six, copper, 29. So if we take a quick look at the chemical symbol that was on the periodic table for carbon, you may have noticed that there's a number up in the corner, six. That six is its atomic number. The atomic number is based on the number of protons in the nucleus. So carbon has six protons. Since protons are positively charged, that means for a balanced carbon atom, there are also six negatively charged electrons to balance those out. So it has six protons and six electrons. When it comes to the number of electrons in any given shell that is orbiting around the nucleus, we can calculate that using the formula number of electrons is equal to 2n squared, where number e minus is the number of electrons in any given shell is equal to two times the shell number squared. So for example, 
In the first shell, 1 squared is 1 times 2, you can have two electrons in the first shell closest to the nucleus. The second shell, 2 squared 4 times 2 is 8. You can have upwards of 8 electrons in the second shell before it's considered full, at which point another shell will form around the nucleus after that. So in the third shell, you can have upwards of 18 electrons. And the fourth, fifth, and sixth shells, they're considered full at 32. So looking at those numbers, I can have two electrons in the first shell, eight in the second shell, which means if I have a full first shell and a full second shell, I have a total of 10 electrons, and so on and so forth. Here's a sodium atom. And again, how many electrons are in the valence shell determines the electrical properties of a material or chemical properties. We know sodium is very reactive, right? It has one electron in the outermost shell. Because we go back and look at the formula of 2n squared, the maximum number of electrons I can have in the first shell is 2. And after that, the next electrons have to go into the second shell. And the second shell is filled after 8. So 2 and 8 is 10, which leaves one remaining electron in sodium, which has an atomic number of 11, left out in the valence shell. And that one electron is looking for something to do. It's looking to attach itself. It's looking to react with something. And again, that's why sodium is in the reactive column of the periodic table. Let's see how this all unfolds for a copper atom, because most people know that copper is a good conductor of electricity. The atomic number for copper is 29, and because it's a good conductor of electricity, copper has one electron in the valence shell. But how do we arrive at that conclusion? Well, if we go back to the formula for shell fill, where the number of electrons in any given shell is equal to 2n squared, we did see that in the first shell you can have two electrons which means if i start off with 29 electrons in a balanced copper atom because it has 29 protons and i take two away for the first shell i'm left with 27. now if we take a look at the second shell and realize that the second shell can hold a total of eight electrons and I have 27 left, well, that 27, take away 8, now leaves a remainder of 19 electrons left to fill more shells. The third shell can hold a total of 18 electrons. I had 19 left over, so 19 take away 8 leaves me one lonely electron in the outermost shell. And that's how we arrive at the number of electrons in the valence shell. And for copper, we are left with one electron way out in the valence shell. This electron is a long distance away from the nucleus, and it doesn't really have any other electrons to pair up with in its outermost shell. It's by itself. And this is part of the reason why it's a good conductor. Conductors conduct electricity. They easily allow the flow of electrons through them. They typically contain one to three electrons in their valence shell or outermost shell. For the most part, when you heat them up, their resistance increases. The top four conductors in order are silver, copper, gold, and aluminum. In the next unit, we're going to learn more about the definitions of current, voltage, and resistance. But for now, electricity is the flow of electrons, which is current. Current is the flow of electrical charge over time past a given point. And we measure that in amperes. Voltage is electrical pressure 
or pressure that we put on electrons to move. When we apply pressure to the electrons, they push themselves along the conductor from one to the next to the next. Basically, you can think of it like a tube full of marbles. If a tube is full of marbles and you put one marble in one end, that marble pushes all the rest all along the inside of the tube and a different marble pushes out the other end. This process is repeated over and over and over again, and that is essentially the flow of electrical current. The electron you put in one end is not the electron you get out at the other end. One electron goes in, it forces all the rest to move along, and then a different electron pushes out the other end. Electrons are little physical things. They're much, much lighter than a proton. A proton's mass is roughly around 1,850 times more. The physical size of an electron is, well, up for debate. There's different ideas where they think that electrons are three times bigger physically in size compared to a proton. And there's equally mathematics that can prove that electrons are 1,000 times smaller than a proton. The thing we know is, well, they are little physical things and they are subject to the laws of physics. So when you force an electron into a conductive medium, it forces one out and pushes it along. And there's always a little bit of resistance or a little bit of energy needed to do that. So it takes effort or resistance to move one electron out as you put another one in. You can sort of think about it like a game of billiards or pool. If you take the cue ball and you hit another ball, the majority of that energy is transferred from one to the next. There's a little bit of resistance, but for the most part, the majority of the energy is pushed forward. However, if your cue ball hits two balls in play, well, that energy is divided between the other two balls. So, all the energy coming in from the one you push in is divided or separated between the other two, which means not as much of the momentum or energy is pushed forward it's divided or split between the other two. Or there's more resistance or opposition to the flow of the balls moving forward. So it's much the same when an electron comes in and the conductor, or whatever the atom is, only has one electron on the valence shell. The amount of energy on the incoming electron is for the most part transferred to the outgoing electron. So atoms with one valence electron tend to be good conductors because less energy is lost in the process. Typically when there's more electrons in the outer shell or the valence shell, that energy gets divided, which typically, not always, typically states that that material is going to have a higher resistance or a higher opposition to the flow of electrons. Now, when you get to the situation where there's six, seven, or eight electrons in the outermost shell, or more, the, in, the energy coming in from the incoming electron gets split up between the number of electrons in the valence shell. And when there's eight, that energy gets divided up so much that it's really, really challenging to get the electrons to move along or move out of the way. And that is indicative of conductors. Conductors require a huge amount of energy or force coming in in order for that material to conduct the flow of electrons. So again, conductors 
Typically, they contain one to three electrons in the valence shell. They, for the most part, easily conduct the flow of electrons through them. A lot of metals tend to have one to three electrons in their valence shell. And that's why they're what we call good conductors. It does not take a great amount of energy coming in to move electrons out of their orbits and push them along to the next atom, to the next atom, to the next. Semiconductors are materials that aren't really good conductors, but they aren't good insulators either. They typically contain four electrons. So they're getting to the point where the energy coming in is divided up, but it takes some energy to move electrons along, but not great amounts of it. Semiconductors are special in the sense that their resistance tends to decrease as energy is entered into the system, such as heat. Two common materials that are semiconductors are silicon and germanium. There's a few others that also fit in there. Typically with a semiconductor, we do something that we call doping. That's where we combine the semiconductive material with something else, like arsenic or beryllium or something like that. So that when the two materials combine, I'm left with either a positive ion or a negative ion. I either end up with one extra electron in the combination, which allows me a free electron or one that's very available to conduct, or I end up where I'm short one electron where I want an electron. So I have a net positive charge in my material. And that's where we get our P-type and N-type materials for semiconductors. A P-type semiconductor material is a combination where I am short one electron in my combination because it's net positively charged. It has a positive ion. My n-type or negative type material is when I bring two different materials together and in that combination they actually have one extra electron that they don't really want so I have one available electron that easily conducts. Again, insulators insulate or isolate, if you wish, or resist the flow of electricity. They contain seven or eight valence electrons in the outermost shells. The best examples of insulators are actually compounds. And they are usually made up of such things as rubber, glass, wood, plastics, those kinds of things where there are strong chemical bonds, keeping the electrons in their orbits, making them even more challenging or difficult to move out of their orbit and push current through or allow the flow of electricity through the material. So when we look at the periodic table, we can sort of get a feeling for the conductivity of the material. The light blues in the middle are transitional metals, and most of those, when you work out the numbers, tend to have one to three electrons in them. The metalloids, or kind of the purpley ones, like boron, silicon, germanium, arsenic, arsenic, antimony, polonium, in there, they tend to be, or work out, to be your semiconductors. On the far left-hand side, you have the alkaline earth materials or reactive materials. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubium, cesium. They have one electron in their outermost shell. And those ones in particular tend to react or be very, very reactive. And that's why they help in making really good batteries. They react really well. There's electrons in there that are willing to do work for us. But the problem is, is that that also makes them very dangerous. They tend to, to explode or burn very, very easily. On the opposite end of the periodic table, 
where we have helium, neon, argon, krypton, xenon, radon, those are what we call the noble gases. And they're special because each one of those always end up with eight electrons in their valent shell. And that magic number of eight means that those gases don't want to react. They're very happy to be by themselves. So they make decent insulators. And they don't react with other materials within the periodic table. The orangish ones, the other metals, as well as some of the non-metals, are wrapped around the metalloids, the ones that we said make decent semiconductors. And depending on which combinations are the green ones and the orange ones, you mix with the purple ones, that's how you end up with your N-type or P-type semiconductor materials. And that's what we call doping them, mixing them together to either give us short one electron, making it net positive, P-type material, or we end up with one extra electron, which gives us an N-type material. In Unit 2, we're going to go into greater detail about voltage, current, and resistance. For now, to introduce it or segue into it, there are six basic ways to produce electricity or put pressure on electrons to move. We call these electromotive forces, EMF, or ways to generate voltage. The most common and the most efficient way to do that is electromagnetism, such as a generator, where you spin a wire inside a magnetic field. The second most efficient way to do that, by volume, or maybe the most common, is chemical action, such as batteries or fuel cells where you use a chemical reaction to give you a surplus of electrons, and then you can use those electrons to push them or move them along a conductive medium or conductor. Pressure is another way to do it. This is used quite a bit, even though we don't always think about it. Basically, there are certain crystals where you can put pressure on them. And much like an accordion, if you know what one of those are, when you squeeze it, air comes out of it. But in this case, when you squeeze the crystals, electrons come out of it. And then when you relax the material, electrons go back into it. It generates an AC signal or alternating current. This is also part of the piezo effect. Heat is another way to generate electricity. It's not quite highly efficient because it doesn't give you large quantities. It is extremely accurate. Basically, you bring two different metals together, and at that particular junction, if you change the temperature, it moves the electrons along. You can then predict by the amount of electron movement what the temperature is based on the metals that are together. And that's how we do temperature probes. Two different metals brought together and then they react. Friction is one that most of us are familiar with. You walk along the carpet and then you touch something and you get a little spark. Lightning is also an example of friction. One that is very efficient and we're constantly upgrading and improving upon is light, such as the photovoltaic cell or solar cell, where you use sunlight to come in on a semiconductive material. The light reacts with the material and pushes the electrons along. These are the six basic methods for producing or generating electricity. So in the previous slide, we were using some sort of process 
to move electrons or put pressure on the electrons, generate voltage. The other side of that is where we can actually use electricity to do something for us or effects from electricity. One that has completely changed humanity is the idea that we can pass a current through a wire and a magnetic field is set up from that movement of the electrons. Electromagnetism, where you can generate an electromagnet such as a battery hooked up to a piece of wire that's wrapped around a nail. You pass the current through the wire, it creates an electromagnet. Chemical reactions can come about from the passage of electricity, such as electrolysis, where if you pass a current through water, you'll actually break down the water molecule and then you will get hydrogen and oxygen back out. The piezo effect or the crystal I talked about earlier, it also works in reverse. If I put an alternating current onto a crystal, then it will vibrate at the frequency that I put in. And that's how clocks and watches keep track of time. There are crystals in your computers and any sort of receivers or transmitters use this process in order to get the proper frequency. Heat, electric heat. Basically what it is, is you take a conductor that has a high resistance and you pass a current through it at a high rate. The friction of the electrons passing through the material cause the material to heat up much like rubbing your hands together. If you rub your hands together, they'll heat up due to the friction. So too most conductive materials will heat up with the passage of current through them. And in unit two, we'll learn about that. It's called power or true power, heat measured in watts. Finally, light. And there's a couple of different ways to generate light from the passage of electricity. One is through light emitting diodes, which again uses those P and N type materials and where the, you excite the electrons to go into what we call a higher orbit, or you add energy to the system. And when the electrons relax and come back down from their higher orbit, they release that energy back to you. That release of energy is what we call a photon. That's the energy used to either increase an electron to a higher orbit or to bring it back down from a higher orbit to a lower orbit, we get a packet of energy called a photon back. If that photon turns out to be moving within the visible light spectrum, then we can see it. So in quick review, the atom is the smallest part of an element where that material still retains all its chemical properties. The three basic parts of an atom are the proton, electron, and neutron. Protons have a positive charge, electrons have a negative charge. Neutrons have no charge. They just provide mass to the element. Valence electrons are located in the outermost orbit of the atom. And that determines the material's electrical properties. Insulators do not conduct electricity easily. Insulators tend to have seven or eight electrons in their valence shell. Semiconductors contain four valence electrons, but they may also contain five or six. Molecules are formed by joining atoms together. Semiconductors are materials that aren't really good conductors, nor are they good insulators. The basic methods for producing electricity are electromagnetism, 
chemical action, light, heat, pressure, and friction. On the opposite side of that thing, when we pass electricity through something, we can get five basic effects. They are magnetism, chemical reaction, light, heat, and pressure. 